what's up everyone? It's Mel from Fortin Amps and I'm back again with another video with Kenway. If you haven't checked out the previous video, I highly recommend it. My good friend Kenway does a deep dive on IR's mic placement and breaks down how to use the microphones in the Fortin Amp suite to get just the right qualities and characteristics. In this video, Kenway breaks down each frequency in the EQ to give you a better idea how each frequency affects your tone in the mix. And if you don't know who Kenway is yet, you're missing out. Kenway is a producer from the Midwest with tons of experience in metalcore, who's worked with the likes of Joey Sturgis, Josh Schroeder, and Evan McKeever. So without further ado, let's jump into it. I, someone is gonna come yell at me for this. I'm just positive. But when you get down to that sub 100 Hertz range, a lot of what you're getting on the guitars is just gonna be flub. And live, when you're sitting in, and playing your guitar, your guitar amp in front of you, sounds sick. In a mix, not so much. <laughs> it really doesn't help you out any there. Uh, so I mean, almost any time in a metal in a metal mix, this thing's going to be like all the way down or pretty close to it for me. Um, come at me, I guess. <laughs> With this particular EQ, you're going to notice a lot bigger changes when I when I make those swings, right? Because now that 125 is really kind of the heart of where the like that low end thud that you you know want or don't is going to come with it with this particular guitar. And so when you crank it way up, it gets really tubby, and when you take it away, it gets really thin. And so this, while this is a, a knob that has a lot of potential, it's also one that you've got to pay really close attention to because there is such a thing as too much. And too much for me right now is just above where I've got it. <laughs> so if I take this right now, we're at two decibels. If I take this and turn it up at all, then we start to get some of that kind of weird, like wubby tubby sound that you definitely don't want in your mix. So if we, if we push this in a you know, much higher than it already is, Yeah, you, you hear that like we're not affecting, we're not playing with the high end of this amp at all. But you see it as I keep turning this up that it gets like thicker and almost like almost like weirdly like distorted and crunchy like in a clipping way. And your top end just starts disappearing. I mean, and quickly too. Like it's not even it's not even like a subtle thing when you push this thing up. The top end actively is going away. <laughs> And so we've whoop, we've got the same thing going on with this one. We're we're in that two fifty range. For me, as an, as a recording engineer, we're kind of now in the space of the snare drum, right? So your your snare is is usually going to kind of sit in that like uh, one one fifty maybe if you've got like a lower tuned one to like 200, 225, somewhere in there, maybe two fifty if it's a higher pitched one. Um, and so this is. A both a really important frequency to nail down for the thickness of your guitar, but it's also one that you've got to be careful with balancing around other other elements in your mix. As especially in metal, if your snare drum doesn't cut through everything, your song's not going to sound good. That's just, that's just part of how it is. People will listen to it, and the the mix will feel boring and flat if 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 your drums can't like cut through the way that they need to. And so this is a really important frequency to get right. And so while we want to make sure that we don't lose the fullness sound of the guitar, we do want to make sure that we don't have it up so high that it's interfering with other elements' ability to push through the mix the way that they need to. Maybe you're maybe right there. We're getting a little bit, I've, I've got it bumped up a little bit because we're getting a little bit of extra like fullness out of it. And I really like that, but it's not so much that we're starting to, to get that kind of weird, that weird distorted sound again, like what we did before. Woo! Yeah, 
Now we are liking midtones a lot more than I normally do these uh, today. <laughs> uh, so 500 is another sticky one. Uh, I think 500 hertz and 700 hertz are two of the ones that uh, audio engineers all over argue about which is like the worst frequency set. Some people say 4K. Some people, some people will say like just the high range frequencies are the ones that bother me. Uh, but I think that like that 500 to seven and maybe even 800 range is a really tricky one for mix engineers, especially when they're first starting out. And I know that before I ultimately decided that 700 was the worst was the worst frequency. I think 500 used to used to make me angry, and you'll notice a lot of it in, I think, virtual instruments, especially that are like strings or like orchestral, tend to have way too much 500 going on. And I think that that's one of those things that we hear as young engineers, and we say like, oh, these these strings don't sound good, when in fact it may actually just be that they're way overloaded on 500. I know that we're not talking about strings right now, but. This whole like 125 to 500 section is just like so brutally crucial to get right for your guitar tone. Because if you have too much or too little of any of those frequencies or any of that, that range, you're gonna notice and it's it's gonna be upsetting for sure. Also, quick pro tip if you didn't know, this is a thing for a lot of plugins, but certainly not all of them. Um, but it's really useful if you are trying to get something back to the back to zero really fast. If you double click the double click the control, it'll go back. Um, okay, so one one K is next. This is a we'll just listen, I'm not here to I'm not here to throw punches. One K is kind of gross in general on most things. I, I don't the one K is a frequency I cut out of a lot of stuff. And I think it's probably because it's still kind of close to that like 700, 800 range that people tend to be weird about anyway. But this is the first one that like if you crank this thing all the way up like what we were doing when you make those big moves. It sounds real weird, real fast. This is also the first knob that if you take it away completely, while it doesn't sound good, it doesn't sound lacking the same way that the other ones do. Like if you take away that 250 or that 500, we'll just do real quick. That's like a big deal, right? Like those losing those frequencies the way that you do in that situation completely changes and makes the tone like not really listenable in a, in a mixed sense. But with 1K, when you drop it, it makes it sound different, but not like unlistenable in the same way. And so it just goes to show you that like these knobs don't exist because the like you know the developers just went oh let's give them 1k or let's give them 500 they all exist because they all affect the tone in such fundamentally different ways from one another that like you know learning the frequencies and kind of what their tropes are and how they work across all instruments is going to make you a better mixer a lot faster than just kind of like winning it all the time Yeah, so I think I'm going to pull that one down just a little bit. I don't ultimately dislike 1K in this particular frequency range right now, um, but I know that if I if I have much more than this, it starts to get kind of like a twangy sound that I'm not a big fan of. Woo. So kind of in a similar vein, um, on this one, you know, if we if we turn it up a little bit, I don't think it sounds bad by any means, but it starts to develop a kind of twain that if I pull it back, it loses and, and we're starting to get more of that, more of that body, you know, letting more of that low end kind of shine through, which is a really difficult thing, I think, to do in metal, metal guitar. Something I struggled with for a really long time, for, for sure. And again, notice that like, I'm playing with something that is firmly in the mid range and like we're starting to get into like the higher section of the mid range, but the low end is the reason why I'm changing it. Right. Like I think that ultimately people, you know, especially when, they, when they're younger mixers or younger guitar players, they focus a lot on what the knob that they're, 
what the knob that they're turning is doing to that section. Like they're paying attention. If they turn the treble off, they're hearing the high end get bigger and that's where they're focusing and less so on what it's doing to the rest of the frequency spectrum. All right. Now the, 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 the next one, the, here, here's the, uh, this is the, um, what do you want to call it? Like the, the highly contested 4k. Oh, You see how gross that gets when you turn it up? <laughs> it's not a good frequency. <laughs> and I, I will say that like when you when you nuke it completely out of there, right? It's still it it does something negative to the tone. We don't want to get rid of 4K altogether. But man, when I it I apologize for turning that knob all the way up because I'm sure that wasn't pleasant for you, the listener. <laughs> But in this case, I'm actually going to turn it up because it's starting to give me some clarity back into the mix that that we we've, we've been lacking this whole time, right? I mentioned earlier that when we have that 414 on, that it gives us that kind of like bright top end fizz right away, which is probably why it's the default microphone uh, that loads up with the cabinet because what obviously what Fortin's trying to do is give you the best possible chance of getting something likable and usable really quickly so that you can just focus on creating, right? So it makes a lot of sense that they would load up the 414 as the default microphone because it's going to give you some of that top end. But we took that away and we went with something that's going to have, that's got a, like a bolder midsection and like a kind of a warmer feel to it. But now that we're playing with the EQ, you know, still inside the box, still right inside the same plugin, we're starting to get some of that clarity, some of that sheen back because we can, we can get it in other ways like, you know, bringing bringing the low end down a little bit or maybe just like you know pushing 4k a little bit and now the comments are going to get angry everyone's going to be like no this can't listen to kenway he turned 4k up how dare he <laughs> turning that 4k up a little bit is what's giving me a pleasing guitar tone that i like in the moment uh but there's a really great chance that we'll now i would come back later and turn it down uh because we got two more we got 8k and 16 and this is where we're going to really start to, to to hear some of that sheen come out and again i apologize in advance when i crank this thing up to 12 it's probably not going to sound very good I think that's actually pretty, that's pretty good, right, right, kind of, you know, right there around where it's centered. But you'll notice one thing that when I start turning the knobs, once I decide that like, okay, let, let, let's figure out where we want the sweet spot to be, I look away from the screen and it's it's for two reasons. Um, for, for one, that you're, so fundamentally as a human, your ears are gonna hear different things. Uh, none of us are babies, right? None of us, none of us have just come out of the womb with, with as perfect of ears as we're ever gonna have. And, uh, over time, if you don't, you know, take care, take proper care of your ears, uh, both of them for sure. But, you know, if you tend to favor one over the other, this is one of those things where like it kills me when I see a band on stage and their drummer of all people has like one ear out. I totally get it. Like sometimes it's hard to hear the clicks or whatever, and you've got to do in the moment what you've got to do. But you can really damage your ears at live gigs by not having hearing protection. If you only do it in one, now you're going to be offset. And that is, that's something very real to me. Um, I have uh, I have a little bit of tinnitus and it's worse in my left ear than it is in my right. And so the first part of this is that I'm gonna turn away because I wanna be able to hear the whole sound through like one audio source, essentially, right? Like I get a clear picture of exactly what I'm listening to if I can rely on one ear for a few seconds. That's part one. And part two of that is that also, I want to make the decision of what I'm hearing based on what it sounds like not what it looks like and that is something i know that gets that gets really uh maybe even overshouted in the audio community people will like down things like spectrum analyzers um, or eq that have like a visual element to it because they want you to focus on what you're listening to and not what you're hearing and i agree with that but i do think that those tools still have their place i think that it comes down to the personal responsibility of saying like okay 
I've looked at this. I've changed the knob. I know now what it does. Now I'm going to take the visual out of it and I'm going to only listen and try to figure out where I want that thing to land. And then you can use the visual tools like what DB each knob is at as a guide later on uh, if you want to remember where you had something set and while you're playing with it. I'm a big advocate for the FabFilter uh, EQ plugin and it's because uh, it's because of the spectrum analyzer that it has in it, right? It has a visual guide and it's not because I want to use that to mix, right? I'm not going to look at that and just like go, oh, well, this looks really high, so I'm going to bring it down. Absolutely not. What it does for me is I go, oof, I don't like something that's in the top, that's in like the, the high mid. I got to go find that. And when I pull up the EQ, there's a good chance when I hear that, that there's going to be a spike where I don't like it. And it makes it faster for me to find what I'm looking for. Because for me, e the EQ is almost always a corrective thing that I'm doing. I don't do a ton of like creative EQ most of the time outside of like maybe giving it a little bit of a top end boost, right? Um, so I can use that analyzer to come in and say like, oh, that's where the problem is. And then I'm going to use my ear to set it, right? I'm going to use my ear to adjust where it's at. But that visual tool can still be really helpful to find what you're looking for faster, especially as an, as a younger engineer, if you don't know like what all the frequency pitches sound like yet. Uh, but that just leaves the 16K. So let's check that one out. Yeah, and so with this one, you can kind of see that like, we're not really hearing almost any difference here. And uh, that would go back to the fact uh, that we are probably, uh, we are definitely mixing into an equal, like a, a master EQ right now that has got some of that rolled off. And, but it, it can go to show that like, you know, later in the in the video, I'm gonna correct this top end anyway. We, you know, we don't really need any of the 16K in there. So you can see that even when I like crank it up, it's almost not affecting the audio at all because I'm already rolling it off later in the mix where like, cause I know that that's gonna be damaging to the other elements and the balance of the rest of the mix. And so this one kind of almost doesn't even matter where it sits because either way it's gonna end up sounding the same. I am fundamentally right now, we've been mixing in, into this, this EQ that has two primary things that it's doing, which is it's rolling off the low end below the fundamental of where I want it to be able to be heard in the mix. Because again, we were talking about earlier, this is a this is a metal mix. It's gonna be really dense. There's gonna be a lot of stuff going on in the low end. And for me, that low end energy is gonna come from the bass guitar and the kick drum, not from the guitar. So we are I'm I found the spot where like this is where it feels like we're not really losing any energy, but that we're getting rid of all that low end low end information. Cool. Let's grab that. And then same thing with that fizz in the top end that I'm starting you know, just shy of 9K and kind of starting to roll off that top end sound because most of that is just fizz. And I'm going to do that on literally every single song I mix forever until the end of time. Yeah, why, if I know this is going to be part of the final mix, why spend time building a guitar tone around something I'm going to have to come back and correct later? Whereas right now, I've already got these two major roll off points set. No matter what I do in the plugin, I'm listening to it the way that I'm gonna be listening to it later when I mix. You, you see some of these little moves in here. This is all just little corrective stuff. Um, they're all about one dB or less. Like this one's not even, it's 0.8 dB. It's just those little fun, like those little frequencies that you hear in a plugin that you just don't like, um, that you're there, they're kind of raining, they're kind of gross sounding. That's gonna happen on any guitar, no matter what you do ever. It's gonna be there on guitar sims. It's gonna be there on real guitars that you might throw a microphone. Uh, and those are things that don't ultimately shift or change a whole lot when you're changing the tone of the amplifier. They will, some. Uh, but ultimately, if you've got kind of a gross sound happening at, you know, uh, like, a, like a gross raining around right here, we've got one at 3.8K, that's realistically not going to go anywhere. So, it, I, you know, I've already gone through and kind of done some of the corrective things that I need to to make this the guitar sound good in the larger mix. And so now I can focus on the creative tone, what the guitar sounds like, what it's gonna, and what I want it to feel like without having to worry about all the problems that might be created later in the mix. Outside of the context of the mix, I've now made this guitar sound the way that I want it to just by itself. And so when we come back and we put that in the mix, I'm gonna feel differently about how it sounds now because it's gonna be interacting with everything else. So this is where we are. Um, I guess here's the, this, the tone as we left it. And 
And here's what that sounds like with the rest of the song. Actually, not too bad. Uh, I would definitely make, me personally, I would definitely make some moves to the low end. I, I think it might, or the, the low mids, I think it might be a little bit much right now, but honestly, I kind of dig it currently. I think we just, uh, I think we, you caught me on a day where I'm liking the uh, the sound of mids more than I normally do, and I kind of want to roll with it. <laughs> so there you have it. Kenway's deep dive and breakdown of each frequency in the EQ and how it affects guitar tone. If you dug content like this, let me know in the comment section below and I can find other producers that we can collaborate with to give you better deep dives. And if you took anything away from this video, please hit the thumbs up button, ring the bell for notifications, and let me know in the comment section what other things you would like us to do deep dives on. Again, my name is Mel, I'm from Fortin Amps, and I'll catch you on the next one.